Alright, so obviously something I've probably been avoiding for a while is uh, the daunting task of talking about Citizen Kane, which, given everything else we've talked about in all the classes we've talked about, like, when I, like we talked about Gone with the Wind and like Casablanca the first year we were even doing this, um, so I don't really know why this took so long, but uh, now that it's turning 80 this year, um, I figure why not now, especially since I had the great pleasure of seeing it in the uh, theater recently, which uh, was a first, obviously, so um, that's pretty much the only thing really driving this. Um, I also have this uh, gigantic box, which we will talk about and open up uh, after we've talked about the movie, so uh, yeah. So uh, let's, uh, I guess, just start from wherever. Uh, I guess the idea of it being a daunting task to even talk about this movie, because Obviously, even though Orson Welles had never made a movie in his life and was only like 24 or 25 at the time, um, he got together with his old work buddies and with uh, Herman J. Mankiewicz and put together a movie that ended up becoming what is essentially considered the greatest of all time by many different sources. Um, to the point that it's always the one where it's like when you have a movie that's not really meant to be something really prestigious or something like that. People's genu genu uh, general defense of it is it's not Citizen Kane, so it was never going to be Citizen Kane. So it's like the, kind of the gold standard of movies just in general, even to people that have never even laid eyes on it. Um, might have maybe seen a clip or two, but uh, even people who have never seen it or even know what it's about can still easily make references to it because it's just that big of a thing and that well-known of a thing. Um, and I do think it's also one of those cases where it could potentially suffer because of this reputation. It probably does suffer because of this reputation, because of that whole thing. Um, me and my brother kind of talked about this a while back, where we were talking about that whole thing where we have you have movies that are considered, like, you know, the greatest of all time, and there's, like, a certain list and all that. Um, a, multiple lists that probably look very similar and have very uh, similar classics on them. And even though those movies can be genuinely great, and they're very influential in regards to movies themselves, um, it could also feel like whenever you set out to watch something that is considered to having like an important status, um, it might feel like almost like an assignment, like almost like you're doing homework or something, um, and it could feel a bit draining in that sense, um, especially if it's like some of the older epics. But um, that that in itself might kind of bury how great and entertaining those movies can actually be, um, even if I feel that way. I do think something that helps a lot uh, for Citizen Kane in that regard is that it's only two hours. It's like an hour 59, um, which um, usually when you hear about those big important movies, you typically think of something that's like three or four hours or something, like Gone with the Wind length or Lawrence of Arabia, and it's like all this stuff that's genuinely great. Um, but it might seem daunting to somebody going into it for the first time just based on its reputation alone. And so, with that in mind, um, it's also got the whole history of it, like, uh, the fact that it's basically William Randolph Hearst and stuff like that, but that's not really the kind of stuff I was going to go into. I just kind of want to talk about the movie itself, um, because the people, even, even people that maybe didn't know that ahead of time probably saw Mank last year at least, uh, and got the gist of what the history was. But um, going into it as a movie itself, it is very interesting that it has basis with like a, a real person or multiple real people in some cases. And it's basically this entirely completely concocted by Wells otherwise, because it has the vibe of like a really classic novel, like an 1800s novel or something. Um, like it, like if Dickens had written this, um, it would have fit right in with all his other works. Um, and it even does have that vibe, especially at the beginning, when we see uh, Cain as a child. But before we see Cain as a child, um, obviously this movie was breaking ground in 1941 in a really, really big way where nowadays we have all kinds of movies that have the fractured timeline and start at the end and then circle back around and then even though it's we go into it knowing the ending there's still one more thing um, is a very common thing now and also something that we see in practically nearly every movie that comes out now um, just the complete um, omitting of opening credits uh, and just all of it being at the end 
was something else that was kind of non-existent or almost non-existent in 1941. And 1941 audiences were bombarded with both of those things at the very start of this movie. Only The only introduction is the RKO logo and the title, and then we start at the ending. Um, I, was, I, can't, I can't quite imagine the um, how confounding this must have been. Uh, and it's interesting that it has... It, 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 it did have, obviously, a great reputation at the time and was, you know, covered in accolades and stuff like that, but it's also, uh, you can imagine some people not completely taking to it in 1941 as well, and it kind of still had to work to get the status that it's at now over time um, with all the ground that it was breaking. And it's, um, like, to my understanding, the cinematography especially, which is the thing that's brought up the most when you talk about this, um, there were some people at the time that saw it as, like, being too flashy and, like, drawing too much attention to itself, and now it's, like, basically a cinematography textbook, <laughs> um, which is amazing. But the interesting thing about the way it literally just tells us the whole story in the first ten minutes, like, from beginning to end, it tells us the whole story in the first ten minutes all the way up to the end. Um, and what's interesting about that is knowing that this is about a character that runs a newspaper. So the idea of him putting the news out there and that was his life, but then the opening shots of the movie are him being the news. Um, like he, like there was always him putting out the stories and then ultimately he became the story. And they do a lot of stuff with that. This whole opening sequence, this first 10 minutes, is basically like its own silent film about like almost like this sort of, not quite mockumentary, but in that territory of just, like, a totally fictional character. Uh, in quotes, I guess you can say. But, um, but even with, like, um, the narration and stuff, we're getting the whole, like, it's, it could either be one of those, like, you know, one real documentaries they had way back then, or it could also be, like, a silent film if you took out the narration. Um, but also the narration gives that whole vibe of it being this, um, very classic newsreel that was, like, kind of, he was kind of, taking jabs at some particular people, um, Henry Luce in particular, who was like this media giant at the time on top of Hearst as well. Um, but what's interesting about that is, to, it's to my understanding, it was a jab at Luce as to why the reporters that are trying to investigate Rosebud and the whole Kane story, um, the fact that we never see their faces, they're like always kind of shrouded in the shadows or not facing the camera. Um, and even if that is like a whole sort of Henry Luce jab or whatever it is, um, I actually always took that as something else entirely, um, that I'm not, I, he, he could have very easily had multiple things going on here, multiple, uh, symbolic things going on here. Um, but the whole idea of how I was talking about Kane started off putting out the stories and that's what his life was and then becoming the story, just that whole idea of the reason people are made famous is when they make the news, but we hardly ever really see or hear about the people behind the news, so it's almost like these sort of faceless nobodies are the ones that make people the famous faces that are considered somebodies. Uh, just the, totally the complete opposite of them. Um, even the one that's like the main investigator we're following here, we like, we never, we never get a close-up of him, there's a lot of close-ups in this movie, um, and we do get like, you know, we see his face a couple of times, but for the most part it's clear it's meant to be sort of obscured in a way. Um, which is very interesting. And then, of course, uh, once we get to the end of this footage, uh, the way it sort of abruptly ends almost kind of brings this weird sense of humor. To the, like, you can sense a dark sense of humor inside of it, kind of. Where it's like we go through the whole Kane story, and then it's like, and then he died at the end. Um, and what's funny is that moment that's quite funny is the whole thing. It just sets off the whole entire movie. Because um, the whole entire movie is about this... Basically, this story doesn't have an end, apart from, oh, he dies, that's it. Um, so then they carry the whole Rosebud thing, and that takes us all the way back. And I love the idea of Rosebud being the big sort of mystery of the movie. And when you already know where it's headed, and you know what that is, um, it's, it's answered immediately. Like, it's literally them trying to figure out what Rosebud is, and then it dissolves into him sledding as a child. Um, and it's like, it ju he just tells you the answer directly to your face. Uh, and the first time around, you won't even notice, which is great. Um, and I also really love the idea of, and I've, I've mentioned this a ton of times, the way I love what snow looks like on film. 
uh, fake, real, it doesn't matter. Uh, it looks great regardless. And the way that Wells basically said one of the things he wanted to accomplish with this movie and the way he shot it was to basically make it feel like he was filming memories, um, especially with it all being the... everybody sort of calling back to how they saw Kane specifically. But going all the way back uh, to childhood where we get that shot, um, one of the first good looks at the whole deep focus style um, where we have his mom in the foreground and she's talking, and then in the background through the window we can see Kane by himself outside. But it's all, like, in focus. But, um, on top of that, I, I guess you could also mention, um, the cinematographer, uh, Greg Toland, who... This was obviously, like, him basically doing a cinematography textbook, like we mentioned, but, interestingly enough, the year before this, uh, in 1940, with, uh, The Long Voyage Home, the John Ford movie, um was him also, and he was also working with the uh, deep focus stuff, and so it's almost like, as great as The Long Voyage Home is by itself, it's almost like it was his sort of training ground before he took on what would ultimately be, like, the assignment of his life <laughs> shooting this movie. Um, and so all of that stuff, and like I was saying, some of it was, uh, you know, criticized for being too flashy at the time, but it's, it, it, it really just feels like that thing where people were almost... I could see them being genuinely critical, but at the same time, you almost get the vibe in retrospect that it's them being kind of startled by something that they didn't really know, they didn't realize they were seeing history in the making. Um, and it was it was something like unlike anybody had seen in movies like this, apart from, you know, we were easing into that era, but this was the one that really blew it up and made people really realize what they were looking at. Um, and, uh, and a lot of other stuff where they have the stuff like, uh, the way miniatures were used with, like, the crowd shots and then just lights are used when it looks like a whole crowd of people moving and it's, it's just an, ina like, one inanimate object with lights behind it. Um, and just constant stuff like that. The whole idea of pushing the camera in and then, like, moving furniture around to make it look like the camera's going through them and then back again. Um, the way, the way windows are used... Um, it's really great. Also, we were talking about the one, uh, the, the deep focus shot at the beginning, and then there's also the reflection scene during the dance scene, the party scene. Um, and, um, there's like, so you could, you could do a whole video by itself on the cinematography. There's the whole stuff where it's, uh, it dissolves, but it's like, there'll be, there's some cases where it'll be something that's like, life and then it will dissolve into like seamlessly into a still shot or a still picture will dissolve into life and it's it's crazy like even now it's kind of crazy <laughs> um and how how seamlessly it's done also but um going on uh like i said there's it's really hard to talk about this in an organized fashion so i'm just kind of running with this like it's so like where do you where do you start and then where do you go after each one and then it's basically it almost feels like the editing of the movie itself uh where it's just like you're not even really sure where to go next um but whatever's there is something quite masterful uh to talk about so i would say um the next thing to talk about i guess would be the way that it's uh not not so much edited but the way the structure is put together which obviously the editing will fall into um, but that whole idea of everybody being interviewed, and it's everybody that kind of saw Kane in a different way, whether it be uh, Jed, Joseph Gotten's character, or his mistress, um, or Bernstein. And what I really love about the movie's approach to this stuff is the way it sort of brings that idea to life of the fact that when you think about the fact that how, like, we meet so many people, but we kind of have these different ways that we are around different people. So there's, like, like if you take five people that you've ever met, all five of those people have some sort of different, see you as a different person than the other four would. Um, and the way this movie kind of embodies that and shows it, like, on film is uh, one of the more intriguing aspects of it. Um, so we get stuff like... Jed's flashbacks in particular are quite long, to the point that we kind of forget that we're in a flashback. Um, and then that's, that's another great moment, too, when it dissolves back into, uh, it kind of, like, half dissolves and then fully dissolves when we go back to Jed, and it's that thing where we dissolve on Jed when he's old and he's talking to the reporter, and then up in, like, the right-hand corner of the screen, uh, Kane is still there from the flashback, and then Kane dissolves out, and just the shadow that was in the shape of that shot of Kane is still there, 
um, in this shot of Joseph Cotton, which is, and it's like, like every other scene, if not every scene, has some sort of creative visual like that to it that's kind of mind-blowing, especially on a theater screen. There were a few things that I noticed that I'd never noticed before uh, seeing it on a theater screen. Another would be um, the way things are shot. I mean, you can tell this uh, on TV as well, but like the things that are shot from below so that when they're like walking around the office, it makes Kane and everyone around him look huge and enormous. And obviously on the screen, they look even bigger. Because um, even on, on a theater screen, it's still the same aspect ratio, so everything still looks like significantly taller. Um, but then the way they use that, um, like the sort of optical illusion thing, where it's, like, there's the scene where he kind of walks towards the window, and we realize how big the room that he's in, when it looks, it looks normal size at the start, but then as he walks away, still in the same shot, it's like the room grows around him. Um, and then the same thing when we see, like, the shots in the office where he's, like, you know, the, the master of everything, he's in these, like, really big shots, they're shot from below, and then when we see him in Xanadu after he's pretty much lost everything, or he's on the verge of losing everything, um, and not, not so much literally, but, uh, certainly metaphorically, <laughs> um, it's, he just looks, like, everything looks gigantic, and he's the one that looks small, and it's kind of, almost feels like the reverse of those earlier shots, where he had, sort of, all of his power, because that's really the whole thing going on here, is where he's, like, always on the cusp of unstoppable power, but he's, like, never quite getting there, and so it's, like, the more he gets involved in that, it's, like, when it appears on the surface he's getting more powerful, you suddenly realize by the end he was kind of getting less powerful the whole time. Like, he was getting, sort of, weaker in his mind because of this as it went on, so he had to resort to stuff like turning Susan into an opera singer, and his big power moment is the clapping scene, when everybody's, like, completely turned on this performance, um, but he's able to force the crowd back um, by having the big clapping scene. When we see, like, Jed tearing his playbill up and all that stuff, and it's, um, the way he's sort of struggling for that, be, to be seen as that powerful figure through the whole thing, um, when there's obviously shots like, like this one in particular, all these shots from below that make him look huge, and then it's like, with the picture of him behind him, it's like him huge on top of him being even bigger, um, and it's, it's almost like this shot sort of represents what he's striving for, where it's like, this is what he expects to be and what he's trying to be, but, like, this is what he actually is. He's significantly smaller than he, <laughs> than he is planning on being. And he's, and he's always so close, whether it be, like, you know, marrying somebody related to the president or something like that. Um, and when he's running for governor and all that, and it's like he's always almost there, and then there's always a setback. Um, until he's just sort of this shell of himself by the time he's older. Which Wells plays very well. Uh, the whole idea of almost playing these two different characters where we have the person that's really striving to get to that place, and then this dude that's just sort of old and broken. Like, in his body language and the makeup and everything, he's just really selling it. Um, and we see that um, in the... Uh, sh she's Her name escapes me at the moment. The actress that plays Susan. Um, where we see these... The flashbacks, and then where she's at now as she's being interviewed. And it's like, when we see her... When we first see her, she's obviously also broken down, and she's, like, drowning herself in alcohol, and she's just at the end of her rope. Um, and then when we flash back and we kind of see the first few times she met Kane, um, she's just a completely different person, a much more, like, modest person and innocent person and sort of... I don't know, happy might be a strong word, but she's significantly, significantly happier when we first meet her than what's going on with her at the end. And what's interesting is we kind of get to see that through her character and through her performance. And with Emily, his wife, we actually kind of get to see it through him, the way he changes to her more so than we see it through her specifically. Um, where it's like we, we sort of fast forward and we're getting to the points where he's kind of in this darker and more arrogant place. And then it's like we get a sense of love at the beginning there, like, when he's getting married and all that stuff, and he's saying, like, this is a big opportunity and all that, obviously talking about his, it's kind of his entryway into politics also, but, um, just in general, the idea of him starting the family and all that, even though we know their fate, um, because of the opening newsreel footage, but one moment that's just really fleeting really stands out to me as far as the way it portrays Kane's marriage and the point that it reached and it's when he's leaving this campaign, 
and he sees his child, and he's, like, happy to see his child, and he greets him. And then she's there, and he says, um, oh, hello, Emily. And he, he says it cheerfully. Like, he's not upset to see her. He seems relatively happy to see her, but it's, like, it's so weird. Like, the idea of somebody seeing their wife and saying, like, oh, hello, is so casual, weirdly casual. Like, there's not a lot there. <laughs> like, there's something pleasant there, or something he's trying to make pleasant there, but it's just, like, a, such a disconnect, especially by that point. Um, and it's, like, just that delivery in itself always really stood out to me as really a transition where we're seeing where exactly the marriage is before it gets a lot of turmoil once uh, Susan comes into it, and then the whole blackmail thing comes into it. Um, and just in general, the way it views that, um, like how we feel about people in general, there's a really great scene in this um, that really... It's one of those things that happens in real life, and you're worried you're, like, weird because of it, and then you realize it's a universal thing. Um, we're kind of what we were talking about, that whole thing of everybody that you meet sees you in a different way. And it's like, sometimes that can even happen with somebody you have you don't even know exists uh, that happens to see you or the other way around. Where Bernstein tells that story about the girl in the white dress that he saw. And how, like, they never met, he never approached her, he never said anything, and she never even saw him. She has no idea he exists, and she still, like, pops into his mind, even in old age. And it's like, there's... That happens. Like, it's it's really weird, and it makes you feel really weird when it happens to you. Um, but it's like, like, if it hasn't happened to you yet, it probably will at some point. You're just going to see some random stranger, maybe from a distance, and for whatever reason, that person will just stick themselves in your mind and just randomly occur to you uh, <laughs> without even really thinking about it. It'll just happen spontaneously. Um, and that whole thing shows, like, such an interesting understanding that Wells and Mangos would have to have that story in this. I'm not sure which one of them is responsible for that, but, um, because obviously it's, we're led to believe that a lot of the script is Mangos, I believe, but, um, even so, I don't want to accidentally, like, you know, distribute, uh, credit in the wrong way or unbalanced, but, um, yeah, and what's interesting about that also is seeing the decline of Kane is it's interesting that It's a Wonderful Life feels like a movie that's been around forever. <laughs> uh, because, well, because it has. Um, and it's one of those movies that just seems like it's this whole sort of big, giant thing that was like almost at the beginning of movies if you, if you don't go all the way back. Like when movies were what they are now... Um, where there, there was a certain point in the 40s where we kind of reached that point in the late 30s where it really started to reach that point where there's still things in movies today and styles in movies today that we can trace back to those um, despite the fact stuff like you know Birth of a Nation regardless of its subject matter um, being its own sort of textbook uh, like this was in its own way many years later um, the It's a Wonderful Life thing I'm getting at is that It's a Wonderful Life was five years after this and it's like, as much of a staple as It's a Wonderful Life feels, it's interesting how much it feels like It's a Wonderful Life kind of was inspired by this in many different elements. Like there, there's a lot that feels very similar to that, not just uh, the whole starting off childhood, you know, sledding, but <laughs> um, the whole idea of seeing the person's downfall and the way the story's told and stuff like that. I get serious vibes of each... When I'm watching one of these movies, I get serious vibes of the other while I'm watching it. <laughs> Um, which is very interesting. So, like I said, even movies that feel like they're their own monuments in history, that feel like they've been around since the beginning of time, um, probably got some sort of inspiration from Citizen Kane in some way. Um, so, um, going forward, we were talking about um, this sort of dark sense of humor that it kind of has. And I do like that it has that sort of... Like, for every moment where this goes in like some pretty dark territory and some actually quite depressing territory um is it's because when it becomes the whole thing about sort of striving for goals that you never quite get to in that case of you can have something really great but then be so blinded by needing more of it or needing even more success or just say 
assuming that the greatest thing that's happening to you right now is only a stepping stone can eventually get you just sort of dying alone in a really big place uh, with just random possessions that mean nothing around you. Um, in injecting the humor that it does in it is very important <laughs> to uh, really balance that out. Um, I do really like the scene where they sort of... Um, they commandeer the office when, like, with, like, Carter, and he comes in, and he basically takes over, and just Carter's, like, general confusion about this whole thing and stuff like that. We were talking about the scene where Jed's tearing up his playbill, and, like, he's basically playing with it while the performance is going on, Susan's performance. Um, and so adding stuff like that um, for some load is, like, really important to how this movie can... Isn't, doesn't just feel like... This is the kind of thing that breaks it away from that whole thing of important movies feeling like, you know, an assignment that you have to watch or whatever. Um, and then when they bring in that entertaining aspect is when you can actually really start to connect with it. Um, so that when those really dark and serious moments happen, you're already in it. Uh, and they come much more naturally and they don't feel as overbearing and people can, it makes them more accessible, um, which is very important. So, um, I, I guess one other thing I wanted to point out was the whole idea of just seeing Wells in general in Kane, um, like in the character, when you think about the fact that this guy, this is a 24-year-old dude putting this together um, in this way, and there's a line where he says, uh, there's only one person in the world who's going to decide what I'm going to do, and that's me. And it's like, lines like that, you really get this sort of really big vibe um, that it's kind of Wells coming out through the character. Well, you can talk about Hearst all you want and Henry Luce all you want, um, but I personally like to see uh, as much Wells and Kane as I can, because um, it makes it almost feels like this even bigger, grander gesture of a movie from this person that basically says, yeah, I was basically, you know, the king of the stage this young, and I was the king of the radio this young, and now I'm going to be the king of movies this young and make this movie. Um, with just the small amount of things that were given to me. I mean, it's I mean it's not necessarily a small amount. He was basically given the keys to the studio, <laughs> but um, but even so, like with just saying like you know here's my group that I want to work with, and here's the writer that I want to write the script with me, and all that, and this is what happens, and I'm gonna make the movie with the cinema cinematographer of my choosing in the way I want to do it. Um, and it's like if these sort of styles of photography are gonna freak out audiences they're going to be seeing a lot more of it afterwards anyway. So I might as well be their gateway. <laughs> um, and it's like once they stop getting scared of it, like 1941 audiences would, um, they'll embrace it, and then that'll be what movies ultimately become. So what essentially Kane did to the newspaper business, if not you know, going on to other, the other extravagant ways of power he wanted to get to, um, he was obviously still, like, the big juggernaut that he was, and obviously that's what Wells became as far as movies go as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, the final, uh, moment, uh, the final famous moment where it's revealed what Rosebud is. And I remember, I remember my mind being a little blown, uh, when I realized what it was, and I guess there's some people that consider that, like, a lot of people that consider that a... The, like, the whole point of it is that that doesn't have much meaning. Um, but I, even at the young age I first saw this, I kind of felt like it was pretty clear. And I imagine a lot of other people probably um, kind of got the gist immediately. Just basically the whole idea of... There's a, there's a moment, I mean, where they completely say it. Um, like, right before it's revealed, where the reporter says... Um, is going through all the options, and it's like, you know, maybe Rosebud, Remy, Rosebud is just something he lost. I don't know. Um, and it's like, he could mean that in a physical sense, but, um, it is, it very much is something that he lost, and the fact that Rosebud is basically just this physical representation of nostalgia, and the whole idea of getting back, and it's like, the more and more you get to a place that you don't want to be in life, the more you wish, uh, you could either, if, you could either take it as starting over, or you could take it as just, Getting, what I probably think it more so is, is getting back to that moment and being able to just stay in it. Like, sort of like, sort of like being trapped in like a snow globe or something. Um, and it's like, if you could just live in that moment, just by itself, just on a loop forever, that's, that's where you would stay if you could. Um, so that's, that's the way I took it anyway. So, um, 
I think that's pretty much all I really have to say about the movie itself. Um, so I would really quick, really quick, like to show you um, what all is in here. Uh, and I don't really have much space here, so we're probably gonna have to go to the floor. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. All right. So this is something I actually got as a Christmas gift a couple of years ago, and uh, as you can see, it is for the uh, 50th anniversary which means uh, that this thing is 30 years old now, uh, now that we've gotten to 80. And uh, it's uh, got quite a uh, treasure trove in it. It's, uh, to start off with, I guess, uh, we do have... I kept saying that <laughs> the movie is basically like a textbook for movies, and this basically comes with what is essentially a Citizen Kane textbook, which uh, tells the whole story of, like how Mank came into it, and all the William Randolph Hearst stuff, and it's got a bunch of stills in it and stuff like that. Um, and it's it's a it's a thick-ass book, too. It's like uh, however many pages, including, like, the uh, index. It's, like, 240-something pages. Uh, and so all of that uh, basically has the whole history of it, uh, which is great. It's basically, like, you get to this stage in life when you start looking for textbooks of the stuff you're actually interested in, and it's like the, the feeling of almost being back in school, but in a school that you actually want to be, that you're basically doing to yourself. Um, and then this whole thing is like a small book of sorts for like the old advertisements, um, where it's like, I don't know if there's... I think, I think there was something else I was thinking. The West Side Story box set is the one that has, like, the old posters in it. Um, but I feel like this is just as good as that, where it's, like, the different ads and stuff like that. They're, like, actually from the time and stuff like that, and articles that people wrote and all that stuff, um, which is really nice. And then, if it wasn't obvious enough that this is a 50th anniversary thing, which would have been 30 years ago... Um, it's got the VHS for the movie in it. <laughs> um, but on top of that, there is also this one, which is a bunch of different directors talking about the movie itself and its influences. And according to the cover, uh, Roger Corman, Brian De Palma, John Frankenheimer, Scorsese, Ridley Scott, and Robert Wise are just some of those people. Um, I never even mentioned Robert Wise being the editor. I mentioned the editing, like, two or three times and bring that up. Um, and then here's just um, a few pictures of themselves uh, with uh, Wells, uh, Cotton, and uh, Bernstein. And um, Wells behind the scenes. I think they, these are both... No, this one's the campaign picture. This one is Wells behind the scenes. And then, lastly, which I think would have been worth the entire price of this whole thing by itself, um... The Holy Grail is in here. <laughs> uh, the script itself. Uh, Wells and Manx actual script. Um, with this whole um, card in it. Uh, this screenplay is included through authorization of the estate of Orson Wells. And I the actual address. Uh, and then, yeah, there it is. Uh, the words that, like, change the movie world forever. All of them. And uh, that's... Did I even own this at all? Uh, is wild to me. I'm still not over it. <laughs> like I said, I've had this thing for at least a couple of years, uh, and I'm, I can't get over that, so that's great. Like I said, that would have been, just having the script itself is like, would have been worth the whole thing in itself. So, um, yeah, and this was just found at some random thrift store. So, uh, that's, yeah, this is like one of my favorite things that I own. So, <laughs> um, so I think that's going to be, uh, all I really have to say about Citizen Kane. So, uh, there, I finally talked about Citizen Kane. I can get out of the way now. So, um, we're gonna keep doing what we've been doing and talking about individual stuff. A couple of series throughout. We're gonna keep doing the Tremors thing. Um, we're gonna talk about a, a trilogy here and there and a series here and there. Obviously, we're going into October, so we're gonna be doing all the horror stuff and all and a lot more versus stuff and. Whatever else comes up, new releases, all that other stuff. So uh, until whatever the next thing is, I think that's it.